So my name is Timo Pukko and I'm working in um, Lapland University of Applied Sciences and uh, I would like to welcome you all here and online uh, to this our uh, workshop called uh, Storytelling and uh, Entrepreneurship. So Creative Momentum Project, this is a three-year uh, transnational project co-funded by the European Union Interreg uh, Northern Periphery and Arctic Program. And uh, it supports the development of the creative in the industry sector in regions across Europe's, Europe's uh, northern edge. Okay, so hi, my name is Mika Niemela. Hi to all of you online as well. Um, I'm here to tell a little bit about where we are right now. So co-worked by OP Lab. Um, yeah, first of all, a co-working space is about the facilities. So we offer for our members, we offer 24-7 working space, free Wi-Fi. It's better for a more professional uh, image than your home office that you can take actually your our customers to a meeting room instead of your kitchen table. So the community is our members and people who come here just uh, in our in our sort of public space to work for a day. And it's all about the, the vast network of professionals that we have here and um, it's very good for quick validation of your ideas or if you have a problem then you have all sorts of professionals that you can ask help with your problem like if you have a problem with your website there's coders who can help with that if you have a problem with I don't know maybe like copy of a text then we have a freelance journalist who can help you with that and we have all kinds of uh, different skills and um, it's just great to have all these different professionals under the same roof. It's very exciting. And um, the third most important part about co-working spaces that we offer here is different sorts of content. So we offer different sorts of events, workshops like this one, uh, keynotes, uh, streams about events like Nordic Business Forums. Um, uh, also like uh, overall we want to develop the skill set of our members and sort of uh, try to uh, make their time here profitable in terms of their their career as well so they can learn different skills and and sort of develop their professional uh, capabilities uh, here's some pictures of our space so what you can see here on the top is our ground floor which is open for everybody on weekdays from 8 to 4 so the idea is that people can come in, do some work, maybe make a few phone calls in the phone booths, print some stuff, use the Wi-Fi, get some coffee, talk about stuff, network. Yeah, and then here uh, below you can see this is our quiet working space, which is for uh, our members. And this is one of our meeting rooms. And there's this event space that we're in right now. So uh, our concept is that we have uh, we have facilities in three floors. So the ground floor is open for everybody from eight to four and our members get 24 seven access to all floors. So members get their own key and they can use the facilities as they please. So we aim to be, yeah, and the storage locker as well. Why would you choose to work at a co-working space like this? Well, first of all, it's very flexible. So if you're a freelancer or a sole entrepreneur, you don't, it's not sensible for you to rent your own space in the city center. It's too expensive. You have to, uh, like, you you uh, pay for it for a year. You sign up for a contract that says that you have to pay for a year, and it's not flexible. It's not sensible for a sole entrepreneur who doesn't even know how much money he's gonna get the next month. So, our idea is to be as flexible and offer as low as a threshold that we can provide for for entrepreneurs and freelancers and small businesses so they can get a professional environment where they can work. Yeah, as said on the slide, it's a low cost solution in a very optimal loca location. So we're, our space is right in the city center of Oulu. The second important part why you should uh, choose a co-working space is uh, it's, as I said before, it's a professional facility for your work. It's a, it's a professional space, so it's not your home, it's not a cafe. So you have 
a place where you do your work and then your home is the place where you don't do your work it's a very uh, it's a very sort of important differentiation as one of our members has said that he gets twice as much work done here because he sort of he can separate the the home life and the work life and it also is of course a step up from a home office or a cafe because it offers you the possibility to use the meeting rooms and, and gather your business associates or customers here in the same space. And um, third of all, it's a communal space. So the community is very important. There's, I, I read some studies about this and the conclusion that the studies have is that co-working spaces offer a more productive place for work because people work more efficiently when they feel that they're a part of a community. And uh, this is different from your workplace community because in your work workplace community you have hierarchies. Here in a co-working space you don't have them. You're a, you're a representation of your own skills and your own professional sort of image that you provide. You're not in, you're not a part of any hierarchy. You're at the same level with everyone. And um, besides that it's a very positive uh, atmosphere for work. It inspires when people are around you hard at work. You're inspired to work as well. I had these um, small quotes from our members as well. Uh, maybe I'll just read them out loud. First one is from Jason Brower, who is here today as well. Uh, Jason thinks that the public and the private space here is a great idea. Uh, he really likes using them both depending on what he's working on. And um, he says very uh, succinctly that different kinds of creativity need different kinds of space, which is very true. So when you want to talk to people, you can use the ground floor, which is a networking area. And then when you need to concentrate, you can move downstairs to a quiet working space. Uh, so that's pretty much everything that I wanted to say. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them. And uh, if you want to get in contact with me, uh, you can send an email or you can uh, go to our website. Thank you. Okay, so good morning or day, whatever time of the day is it anyway. So welcome here to the OPE Code Lab and also welcome also those who are following this through the web. My name is Emmi Karna and I work in a company called Mystery. I'm an entrepreneur and storyteller over there. So that is why I'm going to talk about storytelling for the next hour or so. I'm going to talk a bit about myself and also I'm going to give you a bold promise that at the end of this you are going to know how to write a good story and also how to write good stories. Just a little bit about Mysteri. So Mysteri was founded in 2015 and we do room escape games. I don't know how many of you have heard about room escape games, so I'm going to explain really briefly and not go through the whole history of the thing. But in a room escape game, you come to the place with small team, roughly from two to five persons, and you are locked in a room for an hour, bound inside the room. So there are going to be different locks and different sort of keys and different sort of puzzles. And in order to get out, you have to solve all of them. And when I come into the display, I design the puzzles, but I also design the story. So it isn't enough in our games that you just solve all the puzzles, but you have to also solve the story. So we don't let the listener get easily out of the room, but they also have to do work not only with the puzzles and with the teamwork, but also through the story. And we started 2015, like I said, uh, then there were only two of us and we started our first room in Jyväskylä. We had a series room, which were, was a story about a student girl who started to have weird incidents in her room. And now we work in six cities. We work also here in Oulu and we have Jyväskylä, Kuopio, Tampere, Pori, Turku and Oulu. And Oulu was just recently, we just arrived in October. So you might not have had a chance to hear from us yet. But, but we are here anyway, so if you want to come to play afterwards, you know where to find us. We are at Rotuari. But nowadays we started with that one story, but today we are doing 16 different stories in our cities. So our goal is to make uh, exceptionally many stories and have them as multiple um, and 
and different kind as we ever can come up with. And our aim it's in this this really small humble aim is to be the Pixar in Finland of storytelling because we want to produce so many different types that we we want people to get the feeling that once they come to the mystery they are going to have a good story with, with them for the next hour or so. So that is our goal and from those two people, me and my partner, life partner also in business and in love, um, we started with two people but we now work with 38 different employees who are also our storytellers. So I'm not basically the only one who tells the stories but I just make the I sort of made good structure so our game hosts can continue the story with the clients and also client is the important part of the game because what is different from a movie and from a room escape game or games in general is that if the player or if the one the person looking at the story doesn't act then the story doesn't continue so that why that is why the games and room escape games in special are a sort of active form of storytelling instead of movies where you just go in and watch a movie and you do it passively so you don't have to act in order to get the story story out of the movie but in this form you have to do something to get the story out and that is why I actually love this form the most and this is, what, this is the one that landed on me when I started my work as an, as an entrepreneur but what basically I do now, um, I used to also host the games, but obviously now I don't have enough much. I don't have enough time to do that. But nowadays, I'm the one who designs the games, the puzzle structure and the game structure in general. But I'm also the one who designs the stories. And here is uh, three examples of our stories. What are going on right now? Um, Victor and Vinti happens in Jyväskylä. In Victor and Vinti, we have made an old bookstore. And in the bottom corner, uh, in the upper corner, we have Jaska and Bubi, Jaska's papa. And uh, Jaska is a kind of rough guy. He likes motorbikes and he has a bar downtown. He has actually one in Bori and one in Tampere right now. And even though Jaska is quite rough guy, he might have a tender side, just might. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about Jaska actually later, because I'm going to open up one of our story structures for you. So you can see how we work the story in different layers. And then we have one uh, called Amuri Noida, the Witch of Amuri, which sets in Tampere. Um, there, is a, there is a mass of crimes going on in the streets of Tampere. And everybody knows that Amuri Noida, Amuri Witch, is behind all of those. But no one knows who the Witch of Amuri is. And that is why he is the one big nemesis character in our stories. And your job is to find out how this apartment in certain street in Tampere is connected to the witch of Amuri. So that is quick synopsis of three of our stories. But like I said, we have 16 different ones. And we try to make them as different as we can. But that is what I do for a living. Like I search good stories that I want to bring to the game environment. And then afterwards I find the good stories. My job is to develop the puzzles so I can get the audience to listen and act with the story. But maybe just briefly I'm going to open up how I ended up here and what is my story behind all this. Because I always wasn't a storyteller. So my story started with books. I was a really shy child and I was also kind of you know, like solemn child, I didn't smile a lot, but, and I didn't have, I had friends, but I liked books more. And my biggest influencer in the beginning, uh, when I started to read books, was, that, I don't know if you know the writer Roald Dahl, who wrote also Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, yeah, Roald is really good. And my biggest hero, um, when I was eight years old, was Matilda the smart girl who read all the books in her library and I wanted to be like Matilda because I thought as a really as a really really tiny child I al already thought that the most important thing that a person can have is the brain and I was really bucked out by the Disney movies where they had the stupid princesses I didn't like uh, the Sleeping Beauty because she wasn't smart but I liked Belle because she was smart and she used her brain and she read books so that's why I wanted to be like Matilda and I can actually give high credit to Roald Dahl that probably Matilda was the reason why I became so curious about life. Because Matilda read everything, I wanted to read everything, and that is why 
uh, when, when I got the library card in Finland, um, I started to went through all the sections. I didn't just read the children's section, but I quickly found out that um, I wanted to read about geography or politics or kings and queens and history and all sort of stuff. So I just, I just went through all the shelves that I could find from, from our tiny village in Ahtari. And quickly, um, actually I noticed at 10 years old that I started to read quite big novels. I read Victor Hugo, I, I read um, Lord of the Rings and all that big sort of stuff. And on the small books wasn't, weren't enough for me. And once I started to go to the adults section, I also started to see the movies. So the point of this is not to tell what kind of movies I saw, but the point of, point of this part of my history is that from an early age, I spent time with stories. So my knowledge about popular culture is quite large and I didn't do it purposely, but I like now behind, if I think back right now, it has helped me a lot to know what kind of things have been done and especially what is a good story. Because once you know what is a good story, then you can start to digest that and slice it up a bit and find out the key elements that make the good story. Because if you like a story for some reason, then probably it's a factor that you can take out and do it yourself later. So that is one of the key elements in the recipe that I'm going to show you later. But the point was that I spent a lot of time with films and movies and with stories. And when I grew up, when I started to study, um, I, found, I found tourism fields in Uvascula. I went to study, I graduated and uh, for some reason I landed a job instantly. When I left my thesis, I got a job also. So I got to work in an office and quickly I found out that you don't have to know and when you start to study that what you want to do, but you have to learn what you don't want to do. And I learned quickly that this wasn't my place. Because actually my story doesn't start in, with an escape from an escape room, it started with an escape from an office. Because I just so wanted to get out from there. You know, from 8 to 4, from Monday to Friday, it, it's just, it didn't work for me. And after, after about 3 or 4 months I decided that, okay, I don't want to continue with this. So when there was a time when, they, when the employee asked from me, uh, employer asked from me if I want to continue with my work. I said that no, I don't want to. And I didn't, I didn't have any alternative option, but I just knew that I have to get out from here because this is killing me from the inside. So I escaped from there and uh, it was beginning of 2015. Uh, New Year's Eve, I had actually left my apartment also. I had decided to move in with my boyfriend. We had known only for a year at that point. So I didn't have a, I didn't have a home, I didn't have a work. But we had to use this gift card. So I had, to, I had this travel gift card from my mother and father about a year ago and I had to use it because it was expiring. So we googled for options and only option was to go to Tallinn, to Estonia. And, uh, you know, it was beginning of January, uh, not, not the balm beaches in Tallinn. It's, it was basically snow, snow and snow and lots of wind. So when we decided that we are going over there, we decided also that we don't want to do museums for the whole week. I went to TripAdvisor, I googled and I found real life room escape for the first time. And it was funny because I was kind of nerdy also in high school. I played a lot. I liked online games. So I had played actually escape room games online. So it wasn't a thoroughly new topic for me. So we started it. This is my life partner, Jussi. And um, we figured that this is going to be a small thing. Just something to do for Emmy for a while. And look now what it turned out. Six cities. So it kind of like slipped it isn't so small anymore. But what gave us the idea that we wanted to do this so badly was that I said at the, at the end of the first game that we ever let's do one with the real story. That is surprising. You might think now if you have played escape games, uh, you might argue that I've seen one with the story. But if you think through, then I would roughly say that only about 10% from the whole field actually have a story in the game. And there is a difference between what is a theme and what is a story. Theme is only a location. You can come out to a, 
um, for example, there is a sunken ship or you can come into an Egypt or you can walk into a jungle. But if it's only a jungle, if it's only a setting and you don't change as a person, that is the biggest difference. The beginning of your story can be the fact of how the Egypt got into Helsinki. So you can start to tell that there was this, this historical group that they started their trip from Egypt and they had sarcophagus and they were sailing across the, across the Atlantic Ocean and somehow they ended up in Helsinki or they had a time machine and they teleported themselves to Helsinki and that's how the Egypt came from there. But don't just let yourself get away just saying that I have this Egypt in here. Just bother to explain and you already have part of your story. And I'm not saying that you don't get to have an imagination, but the fact that you have to have the explanation because the listener is actually quite smart. They can spot the minor plot holes and loopholes in your story. And that is why my favorite part of the story is the logic in them, because you probably have heard about the causal relationships of what has to happen before something can happen. For example, if I tell a story that I walked in from here, uh, I walked into this building and now I'm standing here, then probably before I came here, I had to arrive probably from Uvascula or from Tampere. And before that, I had to decide that I want to come here. So that is the causal relationship, because if you don't, if you don't think about the story as a causal, as part of events and you sort of like mix it up and you screw it up, then your listener will find out that there is something wrong about the story. And this will cause, my, this will cause problems with the authenticity that you are trying to build up to your story. Because if the listener finds out that there is something wrong in the story, and even though they can't point out what is wrong in the story, then they will, have, they will sense it in, in somehow anyway. So when you build up stories, just focus on the logic. Because in the end, you want the listener to identify with the story. You want them to identif identify themselves with the characters also. And in order to build this identifying themes for the story, then you will have to have empathy towards the characters and towards the stories. And empathy is one of the biggest tools that I use nowadays, because if I want to really, really make a good story that will have the effects of feeling and significance for the listener, then I want to know what the characters feel. And in order to feel what the characters feel, I have to know where they have come, because even though there is a villain inside of in some of the movies, they aren't just uh, the simple simple answer is just to say that they are evil. But no one is evil because they are evil. There is always some explanation why people are acting the way they do. And in order to understand why the character or the story acts as the, as, acts as they do, then you have to build up the backstory. Because unless you know the backstory, then you don't know what caused them to do this stuff. So always design the backstory when you do a story. It's not just it's not because you have to like build a whole historical monument and do do books after books of how this thing was built, but just that you know that it's inside your head. Because when your customer comes in and asks why is this thing like this, then you have to have the answer. And that is the important thing with the backstory. And I actually nowadays talk about icebergs for our colleagues in, and our also our teammates, because there is the part what listener knows in the end, or what the listener knows before he comes in to the place and where you tell the story. But also, this is only a thin layer of the story. But the backstory is this big. It has to be bigger than the one that you are going to build. Because once, you are, once, once they ask the questions of what happened before and why did they do this, and they're going to ask questions, how did they feel and why did they feel that? And, and if they want to continue the conversation with you, it means that you already you have to leave questions that don't have answer. Because you have to have you have to give room for the listener to um, in, engage in the story afterwards and maybe start to think like what if this thing would have happened. So that is why it's important that you don't 
fill all the gaps, but let the listener fill in the gaps. Because that is why the story continues to grow afterwards. And I'm going to tell you an example ab about our story, the pub of Jaska, Jaska's pub, which is now in Tampere and Pori. So the iceberg murder is like this part here is the top of iceberg, what the listener is going to hear, and this is the backstory. So if you are going to play Jaska afterwards, then, um, well, I recommend that you play something else because now you are going to find out the story, but I just want to give you an example. So the synopsis of the story, what everybody, what everybody can read before they enter the game, is that you had a really good night with your friends and you suddenly, in the city, met this guy called Jaska. Well, he was a really nice dude, but you found out that he's kind of rough, but you didn't let that bother you. So Jaska invited you over to his pub. You had a great time, but suddenly during night Jaska disappeared. And now you are locked in a pub. So what do you do? And that is the synopsis. Only something to get the caller interested, now get the listener interested and get over to the play. So what they learn inside the game is that we have different layers. We have the layer that we want every, every gamer to get hold of during the game and we also have the deeper level. Uh, when, when the gamer is so interested that they want to stay out and listen and uh, discuss about the story and ask questions, but we have this sort of like two layers and the layer that we want every gamer to know is that, is that Jaska invited you over and he was kind of nervous the whole time. You didn't know what, what was going on with his mind, but he finally, uh, he was he was acting lightly, but suddenly he just slammed the door and left. And you can find from the Bob that he had a threatening note coming from this Kang called Blue Dragons. And it said that, Jaska, where are you? Where is the money? We are going to get you. And there has been something, something going on with these two kinds called Eki and Bena. So they had somehow made Jaska angry and Jaska had di has done something for them. And you can find that also from the story, but the result is that you find out that Jaska had to leave because the dragons were going to get him. And at some point of the story, the dragons almost get the players also. So when you leave the game, you are a bit smarter. There is a question in the synopsis, is that what happened to Jaska and why did he took off? And after the game, you will know that Jaska was blackmailed, that he didn't want to upset you about with the information, so that's why he just took off and left all the booze for you. So you get to have as much fun as you want it. But the part that is not in this, uh, this backstory is something that our, that our game hosts, Mysterikot, only know. And they, they also grow it themselves. So I, my part in the story is only to do this part. I create the surroundings so our game hosts can develop the story more and more. So that's why the storyteller's part is actually really important. So even though you are the one that designs the story, then just figure out who is the one that is going to tell the story. Because if they have big imagination, then they can make this one go wider and wider and wider and make sure that the iceberg continues to grow under the surface. So the backstory in this is that Blue Dragons is a criminal organization who has been who has been bothering Finland for a while and they are maybe connected to Amurovic in somehow, but they had been working with Jaska for a while for some reason and Eki and Pena, those friends of Jaska, have gave away Jaska's location and Jaska didn't want anything to do with Blue Dragons anymore, so that's why he took off. So that's only one tiny part of the backstory, but the point is that it's, it's, it's so much bigger below here. And for all of those that want to find out about it, then they have access to that information if they want to. Um, they have access if they ask questions. And we want the listener to ask the questions about the story, because that means, uh, that, means that they are generally interested and they want to find out what has been happening in the story. But that is one example about that. But now I'm going to get uh, yeah, at that point also that the truly interesting character uh, is born from their contradiction and from their inner conflicts. And in Jaska's point of view, even though he's a really rough character and he may spend some time with Harley Davidson gang, then he also has this tender side. He, he 
has a hobby of dancing, for example. He, we will find out in the game that the Yasuo has a mother, for example. He takes good care of him. So when you build your characters, remember that they are not just black and white, that they also have the grayscale. But now to the recipe, actually. So how to tell a good story? This is going to be the quick fix. So when I start to find, when I start looking for the next story that we are going to have, then I don't have any idea yet what I'm going to do. So I'm kind of like I'm kind of searching through all the possible things. And one thing happened to me with Amuri, the witch of Amuri. Um, I was going into this middle edge market in Turku. You probably have heard, heard about that. And there was this stall of ancient books. And I went to the stall and I started searching through them. Is there anything interesting? And I found this really interesting book called The Black Book of Witches. So that's why it had, it had a really cool story in the background. It was a story of how this Black Book of Witches was actually a book that the witches in ancient Finland used. And how this peasant man found out that there is a witch in their area and he decided to steal the book from the witch. Because he wanted that all the witches' spells are brought to the public and that's why the witch couldn't anymore torment the people in the village. So he stole the book with, with this really great plot and he tried to mail it to some publicist house in Finland and somehow that book got lost in the mail for 42 years. So that was, that was the coolest part, like how, how, did this, how did they come to this, this place where they wanted to steal the book and then they tried to send it and it gets lost for such a long time and now it has been found. So I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I bought the book and I was, I was, so I was going to write, write the story about this incident. But then I started to ponder it like, yeah, I, I, maybe this is a good story, but I really want to do a story with a witch. So, okay, for, then I was going to do that, that the witch was going to be a historic witch. But then it evolved and suddenly I wanted to do a modern witch. Like if there would be a witch in modern society, what it would be like. And then we ended up with Amura witch, that the witch is not actually a witch, then it's an evil guy who does this and this and this stuff. So what I'm trying to say is that a possible good story is not yet a good story. And it, it doesn't have to be the one that you want to tell. But if you get enthusiastic about, then there is something behind it. And this is maybe the... This is something that I try to do often, is that I have this kind of sensors all the time up and I'm trying to find the meaning and the interesting spark from the stories that I found. There is, for example, a really interesting story uh, in Ulenus about a year ago. Uh, there was this town in Italy and they had this great plot that almost a hundred people were fooling money from the government. So they had this deal between the hundred people that they, uh, one of them would go to work and make it look like all the other persons were at the work also. So there were actually hundred people like like trying to like lying to look like that they are doing the work even though they weren't they were playing golf and doing cooking and anything sort of stuff like that but i thought that was really interesting because i wanted to know how they got there what was the thing and what was the thing that or the key why they decided that hey let's all do this you can fake that we are working and we can go play golf so basically if the story that you are reading is giving you questions. If you are starting to ask yourself, like, why, why did this happen and, and how did they end up over there? Then there is something going on. Then there is, a, there is the spark that you might be looking for. So I try to do this as more as I can. But anyway, if you, have, if you are having problems of finding a story or finding something that you want to do, then start with the things that interest you. That is, also, that is a good start. But afterwards, when you have found what is the spark and what interests you and what, what makes you enthusiastic, then okay, you have some, somewhere to go. You have to decide what is the goal of the story. So for example, if you think Lord of the Rings, the goal of the story is to destroy the ring. But this wasn't enough for Tolkien. So even though he knew where to go, he had a clear goal. But then he had to figure out how to get there. And this is an important part, because once you start to tell a story, you don't start from the beginning, you start from the end. 
and once you know the end, then you have to just decide how to get there. Because once you have the clear goal, this is where the creativity really starts. The creativity isn't the part where you find the thing that you want to write about, but the creativity is the part where you find out how you are going to tell what you want to tell. And there is actually the, the movie director Robert Rodriguez, who has directed um, El Mariachi, for example. He told once in an interview that when he was doing El Mariachi, he had this scene where he knew that he would have a par, he would have an explosion, and he would have a turtle. And he didn't know anything else about the scene. He just knew that he would have explosion, bar, and a turtle. And that was his start. He just knew that he wanted to include all of those objects into the scene. And he started to build the scene so he could include all of those things. And he ended with the result that fit into his movie. So this is what I do quite often, is that I give myself the structural, structural things that I want to include inside the mix. And once I know that I really want to include this stuff, then it's just a matter of creative confidence after that. Is if you think you can do it, then you will do it. And we have this thing in Mystery called MacGyverism. So MacGyverism, MacGyverism is kind of like this idea that if you are in a tight situation, like, like MacGyver was really often, if you are in a tight situation and you have limited resources, is that when you know that you are going to survive from the limited situation, then you will survive. So it's, it's, if you think that, that you, have only, uh, you have only a roll of tape and you have only a pine cone, and you know that you have to get out from here, then you will get out with the roll of tape and the pine cone because you believe that you will get out. Because in creativity, when you are in a tight situation and you do as best as you could, you do as best as you can, then that is the best that you can do. Because in the tight situation, you don't get to do it twice, you get to do it only once. And when you get out from the tight situation, it was the best option that you had. You did your best. And once you know that you will eventually do your best anyway, then you know that the result is good. So that is the thing with this one also, is that if I would have the turtle and the explosion and the bar, I would know that I would get to the best result because I didn't have any other option. So I like to train myself also with this. Um, I go to different kind of newspapers and I point my finger at the random word and I decide that I'm going to write a story with these three words. And they are not going to be the biggest stories or the greatest stories that I've ever, ever written. But anyway, they are going to be stories. And that's also straining your creative mind to think out of the box and thinking of how will I fit these thing is, things in this. So that is why first decide what is your goal. And once you know the goal, you just want to get there. And then afterwards, when you have planned to map, of how to get there, how to get to your goal, then the question is that how will you tell it? Because nowadays we live in a world where storytelling isn't only happening in campfire and it's not either happening only through text. But once you have decided what your path is and you think that, well, I'm not that good a writer, then you can decide that you're not going to write it. Because nowadays we can tell stories through so many ways. We can tell stories through speech, through voice, through sound, through tastes, through pictures, through music, um, how many forms ever you like. So once you have decided what is your path, then decide how you tell it. And for example, my path is tell the stories through real life games. But you just have to decide what is the best format for you. What is the most, uh, what is the special way where you can tell your story? And is it even better to do it in a different form than in the other form? Because we can accept that we are different kind of people and writing isn't this thing for all of us. It might be something else. So to recap, find your inspiration, 
then decide the destination, then decide how you reach destination, and then how do you tell it. And this is actually something that you can practice with any modern story. You can think what was the inspiration for Lord of the Rings, then you can decide what was the destination, where they wanted to go, then how did they get there, and how did they decide to tell it. So this is the quick fix. If you want to tell a one good story, then this is all you need. Just ask these four questions. But only one story, it might be a stroke of luck. It's not, it doesn't yet mean that you are a great storyteller story if you told one good story. But if you want to tell many good stories, if you want to be a good storyteller, then you need different stuff. And this is not a quick fix. This is something that is going to take you a while to get used to it. But in the end, you will have resources of how to tell the stories. So, what I do in my job, these are things that I use and why I think I can tell good stories. This is just, I think, this is like, there might be something else and this works for me. And the fact that it works for me, it doesn't mean that it 100% works for everyone, but at least these work for me. And because I spent so much time with the stories when I was young, uh, I, notice, I notice what are good stories, but I also notice what are bad stories. And for some reason I started to think like, why didn't I like this? And that's why I started to, I started to think like, okay, I didn't like it because this happened. So I started to find the loopholes in the story. Why didn't this uh, suit for me? Why did I think that this wasn't good? And once I started to find the loopholes, I started to learn from the mistakes, like, okay, if you are going to design a time machine, then you don't want to make this mistake in, in your own plot. So I, I find pretty good, I'm a pretty good person to find flaws from other stories. It sounds terrible, but it helps me in my work. If I find a flaw, then I know how to do it myself better. And like I said in the beginning, um, I was really curious already as a child. I am still really curious. Um, there isn't, I can count with, with five fingers the only things that don't interest me in the world. I'm generally interested about everything. And that is why, <laughs> that is why I, I love my job because I really get to do a lot of different stuff. I get to study astronomy and chemistry and everything. So once you are curious about everything, then you have better building blocks for your mind. So don't just focus on the thing that you do in your business. If you are in accounting, then it's fine. It's really good that you know a lot about accounting. But if you want to be a creative accounter, then I really suggest that you explore other fields which are interesting to you. Because then you might start to think outside the box. So curiosity is the key for the creativity. But also, uh, you have to feel empathy. You have to know how the empathy works if you want to build believable if you want to build believable stories and believable characters. Because once you have good empathy resources and you practice them, then you are on the right track. Empathy helps you when you want to set in other persons in other person's shoes. So you have to vary your point of view. And if you have to vary your point of view, you understand different kind of listeners also. In my job, I have to bounce all the time between the gamer, I have to bounce with media, I have to bounce with game hosts, I have to bounce with my own point of view, with my business part of point of view, with our competitor's point of view. And the key is that when we design the game, then I have to change the point of view quite a lot. There are actually seven different points of view that I have to juggle all the time in order to keep the game good for everyone. Because if it's good only for the gamers, then it's probably not good for the game hosts. So remember to change your points of view all the time. And then you sort of have to have this vulnerability to spot the significance from the stories. That if you read a lot or if you watch movies or, or consume stories, then just keep those antennas up 
because if you feel something from the story, if it starts to arouse questions or you feel that there is something really significant in the story but you can't really point out what it is, then you are on the right track. Uh, this is something that is really hard to like put on. There is an on and off switch but it's something that develops over time. So it kind of goes on with the spot to spot, the talent to spot a flawed story is that you have to consume the stories to have this feeling when you read something. But usually I'm quite a teary person, so when I find something that, that touches me from the inside and I want to even cry because it's such a good story, then I especially know that I'm really on the right track. But you don't have to cry for everything, but you can also start to sense these feelings that if you sense something from any story, then it's probably a good story al already. And also about the creative confidence is that it doesn't help you if you, only, if you have the good story and you want to tell it, but you don't have the confidence that you can tell the story. So you have to have, you have, to have belief that you are going to see this thing through and that you are going to see the goal in the end. Because if you don't have the creative confidence, then you can't build a map. So once you believe that you are going to reach the goal, you will reach it. And also, you have to have a desire to grow. So if you decide that, okay, this is enough and I'm not going to change anymore, then your stories are not going to evolve anymore. I'm trying, I'm trying constantly to find different, deeper layers for my stories. And if I want to go deeper into the story, it means that the stories also evolve and I'm not going to produce only the same kind of stories. And how do you keep yourself, you thinking fresh? is that uh, go outside and look at your surroundings and look at the people surrounding you and try to change the point of view. For example, if you are in a breakfast table, you can think for a while, um, what if I would be a cat and what this breakfast table would look like if I would be a cat? Or if you would walk on the street, you would think that, okay, I'm walking now here, but what this scene would like from the point of view of that person driving that car? So do this uh, mind games when you walk around and try to see the world differently because that helps also you to build up the story and give yourself the blocks in your mind where you can build up a story. And also engage in a conversation with people because I've noticed that if you don't go outside and meet people then your, minding, your mind is going to get trapped in your own head and it's not going to be as helpful anymore as you would want it to be. So engage in conversation and really, uh, really just one tool that I love to use. It's this thing called stumble upon and it's this sort of like general randomizer in the website. So I use it to boost my curiosity. It's there's this button in stumble upon. If you press the button, it's going to go through all the web pages that are listed in the service and find you anything that suits your interests. So it has over over 100 different interests. It has, for example, internet comics, online games, uh, handiworks, it has sports, it has uh, all sorts of things. It has so many options for you to find the things that interest you. And once you have clicked them and you, sp and you have an extra 15 minutes in your day, just press the stumble and it will find you something interesting to spend your next 15 minutes with. And that is why when you have clicked everything that interests you, you will find eventually something that might spark your interest to do a story. So that is a really cool tool. And, oh, actually I'm working here. So these are the building blocks that I have found and now I'm building a story. Just kidding, like this is a puzzle that I'm making actually, but this is my work. So I get to play with Legos <laughs> with, with other things. Uh, but a few examples what you can do when you leave here today is that continue to experience stories, continue ex to experience them in different forms and in, in as many different ways and as many as you can because then when you see different stories then you get to ask yourself if this was a good story or if it was a bad one. Because when, she, when you ask that question and you have to find the answer, that, then that helps you to tell later if that was a good idea in some way or a bad idea. And then also one 
question to help with your curiosity or with your imagination is ask a lot what if questions. For example, what, what would happen if a seal would, fry, uh, would fly out the window or what would happen if there would be aliens in Oulu? So if you start to ask these weird uh, what-if questions from yourself and you have to explain yourself what would happen if these what-if situations would happen, then your imagination also gets room to develop more. And then practice those different points of view. Try to, try to for example, if you have a bike, try to bike for a while so you see how Oulu is built for bikers. Or if you have never flown, try flying. Or if you want to if you want to expand the uh, world of taste then try something that you have never tasted before. I just read a research that actually human brain starts to get older after 25 years and after that 25 years we find comfort from from the things that we already know. So we have bigger risk after 25 to stay, to stay on the same track unless we try to get our mind from out of the box. So that's why it's important that you try out new things or you try to get a different hobby so you meet, so your thinking keeps fresh. It, it doesn't end up staying the same way all the time. So try to find different points of view or interests. And then also when you read stories, try to find the meaning and feeling and see if you identify yourself with the characters and try to ask why did this happen and what are the key elements, why this why this, well, this was a good story in that way. And if you're having trouble with uh, starting, if you don't have any ideas of how to build a good story, you don't even have the spark yet, then start with the things that interest you. Because if you already love something and you just want to, stel uh, you just want to tell a story through that, then it's probably a good starting point. If, if you love it, then it will end up being a good story, if you decide to do it through. And then respect the logic in the story, don't break it, try to make it as logical as possible and stay genuine to yourself because the listener can spot the fake instantly. If it's not you, then it's not worth doing. So that was all from me. If you want to visit us, you'll find us from mysterapist.com or you can contact me also in some other way. And now, time for the questions. Thank you. So, your brain is working all the time and you're getting new ideas. How do you uh, keep track with those new ideas? Do you have a, a pencil in uh, your yeah. pocket? How yeah. do you do it? I have a pencil and uh, I should have uh, like a book like that, but I, I carry only different sheets of papers. Yeah. So, I have like at the end of the day, I might notice that my book. <laughs> that my book is filled up with 20 different pages altogether and my, they might be so, uh, so from so many ideas that I would have to get them to the book but I just write stuff down when I get the idea I just have to get it written somewhere or drawn I might even uh, if I talk with someone I might doodle for a while and I read actually that doodling uh, drawing kind of like funny cartoons or pictures might help your brain work if you don't do it like consciously so I doodle a lot and sometimes I just notice that okay I designed a puzzle while not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to let your unconscious mind also work and give it some space. When building these ideas do you generally have a budget that you work with when you're building these rooms? Well not tight one but we have decided that we do have a budget but if we find out something really 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 extra cool that we want to do then usually we have the money also for that so we have this sort of guidelines and you have to have them also because if you would have chance to think of all the things in the world then it would be really hard and I like to also constrict the creativity like that's why the Robert Rodriguez ex example is so great is that he kind of like gives his creativity a sandbox where he has to work and when he has the sandbox, he knows the limits and he knows that he has to stay inside this. And that's why he gets the better result than if you would have all the money in the world and all the time in the world and all the resources in the world. I would be probably quite fr frustrated and it would be really hard. But if I have certain time and certain budget and certain people and certain call where I want to go, then it's probably easier for me in the end to build the solution. 
you running just one story in one escape room or is one singular room usable for multiple stories? Can you change the story mm. in one room? Uh, how fast or how do you work? It's kind of hard. Um, in most cases it doesn't work. Um, thoroughly, like you can keep parts of the room, but you would have to say change something eventually because the story is built inside the puzzles. For example, there is a reason why this puzzle belongs to this particular theme or this particular location. So, if you would change the story, then you would probably have to change at least 30% of the game. We haven't actually tried that yet, but we are actually going to try that uh, in a near time future. That we have a game that we want to use, but we have to just sort of switch the character inside the game to be someone else. And we are actually going to find out later if it's going to work. But right now, I have the thought that it's going to be about 30% that we are going to change. So, mostly yes, but not thoroughly. Because then, if you don't change it from the core, then people are going to see that it's fake. The one that I talked about, the trees, is that you, you have to build it um, through the story, you have to build it inside the story. That you have to, I mean, when I design a game, I have to think the puzzles and I have to think the story. And if I think only the puzzles, then I'm going to be screwed up with the story. If I think only the story, then I'm going to be in trouble with the puzzles. So that's why I have to entwine them all the time and think how they mix with each other and what do these puzzles tell about the story when I continue. Uh, thinking about uh, lean methodologies, I don't know how much you go into that. But a bit. Okay. Uh, do you, how do you adapt when creating a new story? Um, I'm imagining that you get the response from people and then yes. you try to adapt that. How, do you have a process that you kind of described there? or? Well. When we design a totally new game, when it's never been played, the problem with the new game is that it's it's only um, it's it's on, it's coming from my head. So the things in my head are way more clear for me than for the, those who play. And that's why when we decide the game, it's really important that we get the feedback as fast as we can. And we have this test game round. When we have the new game, we usually test from five to seven times with people. And they are actually outside gamers. We ask random people to come to play. So they play, I follow the game, and we have these in-depth questions in the, in the end of the game. So I ask, how did you feel about the character? Was it believable? What did you expect to find from the room, but you didn't find? Um, how was the story going? Were there any loopholes? What did you think of this and this and this? So I interview the players really thoroughly afterwards and we just try to discuss about the game as much as possible. So it's usually a uh, discussion, is, it takes about hour or hour and a half if the gamers want to stay, but it's really important to get the feedback when at then. And then even though once we launch the game and it has been tested, we know that the game isn't ready. We know that the game is developing all the time and that's why our game hosts give the feedback for me. Like they tell me that this one doesn't work or seems that there is a loophole in this part of the story. And once I heard that, we developed the game all the time. So we know that even like uh, if you com to compare to a movie, a uh, movie is once finished. When you release the movie, you can't change it. But in our game, when we release the game, we are we know that it's not going to be ready for a while. And in the test round also, I, I forget to mention that when we have the fee a week when we test with different gamers before the launch, we do the changes immediately. So once we see one team play this game and we notice that they have difficulties with this, I instantly try to think why did they have this difficulty? And if I notice that there is a flaw in this puzzle, I will change it right away. So we don't even expect the feedback from the next round of players because we sort of try to live, we follow the people so closely that we can live with them in the game and we can, we can figure out why did they think like this. And if we notice that there is a flaw that we are not giving um, clear enough uh, solutions or hints for that point, then we change it uh, instantly. And that is what we continue to do when, uh, when we get more and more gamers coming over.
So it's kind of like lean all the time, and that is what that is how we work as a company. Also, if we have an idea, we try to make it happen as fast as we can, because then we are most enthusiastic. Like make the 2080 <laughs> like kind of model that if if you want to try it, then just try it and decide afterwards was it worth it. So it's sort of like how we have been doing without deciding to be lean. <laughs> We just found out later that we are actually oh, lean <laughs> by way, accident, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, did you have another question? Uh, are you observing all the places uh, in Finland by yourself? Are you traveling and seeing those test rounds by yourself or are mm. you relying on your stuff? Mostly, mostly. But now because being an entrepreneur first you have to make yourself useful and then your job is to make yourself useless, right? Yeah. So I'm at the useless point right now. So I'm trying to give as much as responsibility for my host as I can. And I'm not all anymore the only game designer at our place. I'm the head of game design, but I'm giving my knowledge already away because at some point I want my host to design the games. And already in Kuopio and Jyväskylä, the whole team in the, car in the city have developed their own game. So that is also the way we are moving because we want the game hosts to be as involved in the game as possibly they can be. And the best, wo best way to involve the game hosts is to make, give them time to build some sort of game, at least. So yes, right now I have been going to all the tests, but in the future it might be harder because now we have the six cities. We used to have three just a few months ago. So basically your business, you have a, a location in a city and you are uh, uh, creating the game uh, for, for this particular escape room mm -hmm. and you are playing it so long as you are having customers and if everybody is uh, uh, is every everybody has seen the game in that city then you will change your yes, game. Yes, exactly that All is right. the point. Yes. Because in this field for some reason people don't play it more than once. It's, it, it doesn't work like movies. Even though you kind of remember it, you still want to see the movie uh, another time probably. But in this game, if you have the idea, then you know that you will have it the same idea again. And that is not as thrilling to do second time as it would be for the movie. So you can sell your product only once yes. for a customer. Yes, and yeah. if you are in a bigger city, it might be two years, you almost three. Years. Yes. In Tampere, for example, but if you are in a smaller city where you obviously have a smaller population, then the cycle is way more shorter. <coughs> so it might be a year and year and a half. It depends really much, and also it depends if there are any other game companies in the same city, because if you are the only one in the city, then you are the sole provider of the games, and then you have more responsibility to give more games to the gamers. But if there are many different companies in the city, so in other words, there are lots of things to play, then you don't have uh, such a big responsibility. Obviously, you want the customers to come over to you, but you know in reality that if they come to you and they have played all your games, then they will go to a different company and try their games and then come back when you have a new game. So in that way, it's, it's better to have many companies in the city because then you don't have such a big pressure building up all the time new games, which is obviously the the most expensive thing that we do at our business. Uh, how much do you build, physically build, uh, build uh, and create some mm. secret stuff or whatever? Or is it more like a story and giving some hints? We have a building, a building theme yeah. always when we start to build a room. It's basically 50-50. 50% uh, of the people involving in the building process actually build, and the other 50% they focus in the tini tiny detail or in the story or in the puzzles. So it's surprisingly big, but it depends really much in the room what we want to do. If we want to build a sarcophagus, then we will need more building, obviously, but if we just want it to be um, someone's study, then it doesn't need that much building. So it depends really much. Well, okay, uh, more on the business side. <laughs> uh, when you when you expanded your your idea and you've gone from mm -hmm. three to six, for yes. example, um, I'm sure you have some kind of growing pain. Not well. not pain yet. Ho hope it's I hope it's not coming either. But the biggest challenge was that um, just just to explain a bit uh, in. The beginning of September we had only three cities, but in the beginning of October we had six, 
because we bought uh, another company who had had the games in Turku, Pori and Oulu and now we own the games that they had and also the places that they had so because we did this big jump and bought the company we also had 13 different new people starting at our place so the real struggle is going to probably be of adapting to new people with the old people because we had to recruit almost as many people as we are employing before the change so now we have kind of like the old company and we have the new company so the interesting part is going to be when these two types of company of two types of mystery meet next year for the first time when we have our have our yeah have our pre-christmas after christmas <laughs> so that will be the interesting part and also obviously how we are how are we going to give our values and vision and strategy for the new people who have who have not had chance to have as many games as we as the other ones so the challenges are probably going to be with the concepts and with the people but so far so good no clashes yet hopefully they are not coming but we are trying to prevent them anyway thank you <laughs>